When the strange creatures of the forest begin to call your name, trying to lure you into a fate worse than death, there's only one way to survive. And that's to hope your parents gave you the silliest name possible. What, you think a Wendigo is going to say, come here Melvin, without bursting out laughing? Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails to see the absolute amount of chaos a turtle caused in Florida recently. Yes, a turtle. Today I've got an assortment of scary stories featuring the Pigman, spooky ghosties, and a run-in with something in the Adirondacks that might be trying to take people. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your unexplained encounters at darkstories.org so I can narrate them and stop on by eeriecast.com to enjoy our other shows or to shop our store. Also, if your name's Melvin, I'm just kidding. I like that name. Now, let's begin. Something in the Adirondack Park tried to take me. From Georgie. In 2007, I went on a short hiking trip in Adirondack Park with my dad. I was 11 years old at the time. It wasn't the first time I'd gone with my dad to the Adirondacks, but it was the scariest. My dad has always been a big outdoorsman, finding every opportunity to fish and hike and camp, and he would always try to bring me and my mom along. Mom wasn't big on the outdoors like him, but she would humor him from time to time. However, I really enjoyed spending time with my dad, no matter the setting. It would be just the two of us on this particular early fall weekend. The forecast called for warmer than usual weather all weekend. We brought our jackets anyway, just in case. We didn't see many people, oddly enough, as we hiked through the trails. Usually, we'd come across some other folks, especially on Saturdays, but I guess it just wasn't too lively that day. At a certain point in the trail, at around midday, my father had to pee, so he let me know to stay put as he walked no more than ten feet away to conceal himself behind a tree. As he did his business, I sat on the ground and rested for a moment. I took off my pack and let my shoulders relax. Then I suddenly heard something. It came from off the trail on the opposite side of where my father had gone. I swear it sounded like my mother's voice. Georgie, come here. My eyes went wide. Mom wasn't supposed to be here. She stayed at home today, I thought. I picked myself up and moved closer to the edge of the trail, looking for any sign of my mom or another person moving about in the trees. Georgie. I heard my name again. There was no mistake. Someone was definitely calling me. In fact, I could vaguely see the silhouette of a person walking between the trees. The foliage was too dense to make out who they were, but I noticed immediately they were the same height as my mom, and I could have swore I saw a ponytail the same length and color as my mom's. I took a step into the woods, just one foot off the trail. I still wasn't convinced I should investigate further. It was then that I felt two very cold and strong hands push me, hard on my back. I fell forward with such momentum, I began to tumble down the slope, which was steeper than I expected. I banged my head and shoulders on several trees before my foot got caught between a tree trunk and a large rock. When I looked up, my nose bleeding, my head pounding, and my heart racing, I gasped. Inches away from my face was a bluff, with a drop-off of about 200 feet. I instantly screamed for my dad. I heard him call back from the trail. I screamed and screamed until he saw me. Jesus Christ, George! He yelled back in a panic. He scrambled quickly down the slope and carefully pulled me away from the ledge. Someone pushed me, I said to my dad over and over, crying, I was so scared, and my head hurt really bad. Hush, it's okay, we're gonna leave and we'll go get a doctor. We did just that. Luckily, I didn't have a concussion or anything serious. Just some cuts and bruises. 
When mom found out what happened, she was irate. But she calmed down eventually. It was a few months before I went back to the Adirondacks, and I never did encounter anything quite like that again. However, I still wonder what it was that lured me to the edge of the trail and tried to push me over that bluff. Had I fallen, I'd have been killed. But what if it didn't want me dead? What if I'd fallen and was left there unconscious? Would I have become lost trying to find my way back to the trail? I've since become interested in missing persons cases in national parks and state parks, especially David Paulides' book series, Missing 411. To be honest, I think there is something in the forests of America, and I think it, or they, are taking people. A Ghost Attack From EDM Fan Eight years ago, I moved into an old house in a small town in New Zealand with my dog, whom I rescued from a shelter five years prior. Nobody had lived in that house for a few months before I moved in, but I soon found out that it wasn't quite empty. At first, my dog wouldn't follow me down the stairs, where there was a basement storage room, a spare bedroom, and the laundry room. Instead, he would sit at the top of the stairs, whining and waiting for me to come back. He had no problem with any other staircases and normally would not let me out of his sight. One day I was in the downstairs bedroom. He was getting upset at the top of the stairs, so I carried him downstairs with me. He was fine while he was downstairs, sniffing around and wagging his tail constantly. But when I went back up the stairs, he wouldn't follow me. He sat at the bottom of the stairs and whined, so I had to carry him back up. After a few weeks there, I started to hear noises in the kitchen when there was no one else around. It sounded like someone tapping the side of a cup with a spoon, and it happened nearly every day. I decided to ignore it, but whoever was in the house with me did not want to be ignored. One morning, I was lying awake in bed when suddenly I heard a very deep, very rough, almost inhuman-sounding voice yelling right into my ear. Get out of my room. Then something shoved me so hard I thought I was going to fall out of the bed. I found my poor dog hiding under the bedside table after that. A few nights later, I could hear something moving around in my room. It was this soft, rustling, shuffling sound, just loud enough to keep me awake. I tried to ignore it and go to sleep, but every time I began to drift off, the noise would come closer and wake me up. I decided to pull my blanket up over my head, but the noise was just so creepy I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't figure out if I was imagining things or if there was really something there something not letting me sleep, but not really revealing itself. I was scared, but also annoyed at myself for being scared, and annoyed at whatever might be creeping around my room, keeping me awake. So I half sat up, propping myself up on my elbows. The room was dark and empty. I needed to know if there was something there or not, so I said aloud, If there's someone here... Pull the blanket off of me. And it did. The blanket, which had been up around my shoulders when I sat up, suddenly flew down the bed. Most of it ended up on the floor at the foot of the bed. Just the very edge of it rested on my toes. I was completely stunned for a moment. Then I just went into total denial. I grabbed the blanket and pulled it back over me. I told myself over and over and over, that didn't happen, that didn't happen. I just lay down and went to sleep. In the morning, I could not believe it happened. It's the sort of thing you see in movies. It doesn't happen in real life, it's not supposed to, but it did. There's no way I was sleeping and kicking the blanket off. I've never in my whole life kicked off my blanket in my sleep. 
and how can you kick a blanket off so it ends up at the foot of the bed, except for the edge of it resting on your toes? I knew I was wide awake at the time too, and I had to accept that there really was something in my house that wanted me scared and wanted me gone. Eventually, I contacted a psychic medium to get rid of whatever it was. The lady burnt sage in every room, scattering salt across the doorways and windows. She said she felt the presence of an old woman, but she would not communicate. After the medium left, there were no more noises in the kitchen, no disturbances in my room. However, my dog would still not go down the stairs. I think the old woman was still hanging around there, maybe because no salt had been scattered in the stairway. I spoke to her again, telling her she could stay here, but she would have to stay in the stairway and not bother me. Otherwise, I would have the medium come visit again. We lived there for five years. Me, my dog, and the old woman with the demonic voice. The Tree From Gabriel S. For nearly five years, I have lived in a city in Ontario with my family. I'm just now finishing up high school, and I'll be going off to university very soon. The first occurrences started as soon as I moved to this house. It's a split house or an unofficial duplex, so we have a family in the basement, a man and his 90-year-old dad. Meanwhile, our section, the upstairs and main floor, has me, my sister, my mom, and dad. We have the only access to the attic, and a very, very creepy and decrepit backyard, which we've now decorated to be more, I guess, homey. We moved into this house August 20th, 2019, just before my first year of high school, and my sister's grade 4 year. We chose this place in particular because of the cheap rent, although I do favor the idea that it was and still is cheap for a reason. The first thing we noticed, although not paranormal, was the very unkempt state of the house. The ceiling was stained a gross yellow, probably due to in-house smoking. The paint on the walls was chipped and had a nasty smell to it. On that thought, the entire house smelled of rot. We got all our boxes inside the house, then my sister and I got to fight over which room we wanted. Being the eldest of the two of us, I of course got the bigger of the two rooms. I wish I'd been less immature at the time, as the only reason I didn't want the room my sister ended up getting was because of the bad feelings I felt in there. Though having a room right by the attic was not ideal either. At the two-week mark was when things started to become odd. I was relaxing in the room, listening to my music, or watching YouTube late into the night, around 2.45 a.m. I began to hear a loud buzz, then ringing in my ears. I was convinced my headphones had shocked me somehow, so I took them off and unplugged them. Only, I began to hear the ringing getting louder, almost deafening. I started to scream without realizing it, and my parents rushed into my room. Immediately, the ringing stopped, and I couldn't help but cry. I tried to explain that my ears hurt, and that night we spent in the emergency room at the hospital, only to be told there was nothing wrong with my ears. It must have been a nightmare. The experiences became more and more frequent. For the longest time, it was just once a week or so, but now it's almost four experiences a day, and it keeps growing. I suppose I should mention now that my mom practices witchcraft. The energy in the house eventually became one of despair, and it caused my mom to spiral into a deep depression, as my sister and I developed high levels of aggressive behavior. My dad, at this point, was on the road constantly as a truck driver. The whole house had become a chaotic wreck. This was the case for almost six months, my sister would chase me around with scissors, and instead of hurting others, I resorted to hurting myself just to feel something. My sister started to perform messy rituals, 
slicing her palms to give a blood offering to some entity she referred to as the tree. A tall being, apparently, with the head of a deer skull and a lanky, mangled body that loosely resembled a tree, one that my sister liked to visit whenever we went to the beach together. She would talk to the tree as if it were conscious, and she would give it a hug to cheer him up, and I would stare on in disbelief. This thing, which I thought was a tree, my sister treated with more compassion than she gave her own family in the recent months. Zuri, what are you even doing? You might get hurt, I said, before sitting down in the sand. Shut up, Gabe. Nobody asked you. Besides, Mystic doesn't like your voice. My sister retorted, and I stood up in a huff. Fine, be that way. Have fun with your stupid tree, I guess. With that, I walked away. My sister and I didn't talk for a week straight after that. Until Saturday, while my mother and father were out, she ran out of her room in fear. She told me she'd made a grave mistake. And for once, she seemed like my sister again. I asked her what was wrong, and she dragged me back to her room. But I refused to actually walk inside of it because the feeling of danger was so strong in there. On her desk appeared to be a setup for a seance or something. A tall black candle in the center, six small tea light candles in the color white and gold. She then spoke, It's mystic. I... He's here, but it's not my fault. I used salt, but my friend broke the circle. What? What do you mean? Explain, I panicked. She tried to get me to come to the room so she could explain, but I just couldn't enter it. I eventually convinced her to come out to the living room and to call her friends over, since I was curious and worried. Soon enough, her two friends showed up. We had a conversation about the prior six months. I found out that they were fully involved with this tree, too, and they'd explained to me that sometimes the tree would be there. Other times, it would just vanish. They referred to the tree as he. I stared blankly, trying to think of a response, but instead, I decided that I didn't want to be inside the house at that moment. The next thing I knew, I was sitting on the porch, and the kids had run off to the side of the lake, opposite to that tree. Around 6 p.m. in the evening, they returned. We all went back inside, since I needed to make some dinner. While preparing dinner, I heard the kids talking in the living room about how one of the sister's friends had slaughtered a salmon and roasted the corpse over a dumpster fire. I'd never turned around so fast in my life, I immediately brought them into the kitchen and had a talk with them. My talk was cut short when there was a creaking sound coming from the attic, and someone called my name from up there, a voice that was deep and growl-like. When the kids tried to laugh it off, a glass cup behind us shattered like it was somehow under immense pressure. When my mom got back home, she knew something was very wrong. She wanted to know what was going on, and my sister broke down, explaining everything. My mom, of course, was quite teed off, but at the same time she was happy that she finally understood the depression and anger which had overcome our home. We were dealing with a demon which had disguised itself as a tree and went by the name Mystic. We sat down together in my sister's room while my mother called her friend, who was also a witch. Suddenly, my sister grew paranoid and nervous. We need to go, she said. Get out, he's here. My mom immediately stood up and said, Oh my, I feel it too, let's go. And so we left that section of the house. That night, my mom performed a banishing ritual with the help of her friend, and they recorded the whole event. I still can't, to this day, describe what I saw, but ever since looking into the tree's eyes, I've had seizures and aggressive episodes, as if part of that tree is still with me. On occasion, I miss hours, even full days, as if I'm not even there, like I'm floating in limbo. 
I watch my own body do things in an attempt to be me, but it's not me, and I can't do anything to stop it. It seems like I float through different dimensions. I drift farther and farther away every day. The Demon That Follows Me From Anonymous I lived in a very small town in the middle of Germany when I was growing up. Since my grandmother lived just one town over, I often took the bus or my bike to go visit her. She had a dog, a Doberman, and she had an elderly neighbor who also had a dog, a Bernese mountain dog named Odin. Odin was a sweetheart and loved to be pet by anyone walking by. Unlike my grandmother's dog, who only wanted affection from the people she knew. I knew Odin's owner. The two of us were big football fans, which is pretty uncommon in those parts of Germany, since everyone there is such a country nut. He was a friendly guy and even paid me to walk Odin sometimes. One evening, I was walking up from the bus stop to my grandma's house. Since it was the middle of December, it was already dark out, and freezing even at 6 p.m. I was walking with my head down listening to music and doing my best not to let my hand freeze off as I smoked a cigarette. Now the road my grandmother lives on is dark, barely a street light in sight, but it never bothered me. Unfortunately, this also meant that when I was walking, listening to thrash metal and looking down, I was scared to death when a shadow jumped at the fence Luckily for me, it was just Odin, wanting some attention. Oh, hey boy, you scared me. Who's a good boy? I said, taking off my headphones and petting the little rascal. He was happy that night, wagging his tail back and forth as he tried to lick my hand. I stepped closer to the fence and put the cigarette into my mouth so I could pet him with both hands. I did that for a little while, enjoying the warm touch of his fluffy fur on my frozen hands but then, Odin suddenly stopped wagging his tail. He began to growl and show his teeth. What's wrong, boy? I asked. Obviously, the dog did not respond. That's when I noticed he was not growling at me, but behind me. I froze in my position and stared into the mirror-like reflection of a yard decoration nearby. I watched as a darker-than-the-night figure moved closer from the other side of the street behind me. Odin then began to bark, snapping me out of my trance. Instead of running to the next house, I jumped over the fence to get behind Odin. That's when I saw this incredibly dark thing standing in the middle of the street. No, it was darker than dark. It had no discernible features other than the way two long arms and incredibly sharp teeth which nearly made it look as if it was grinning. Out of nowhere, my grandmother's Doberman, Luna, came running, jumping the fence with ease and lunging at the dark figure. Odin followed suit, and they barked at the thing like crazy. I couldn't scream, though. I could do nothing but watch while grabbing the cross around my neck. I started to mumble a prayer, one for protection of everything evil praying and asking the archangels and God and everyone for help. Right away it appeared that this thing did not like me praying. It swatted the dogs out of its way and made its way over to me in large strides. I turned and began to run, not interrupting the prayer, but just screaming louder. I was yanked back by my hair, landing on the ground, the air forced out of my lungs. I watched as the darkness stood over me, grinning. I closed my eyes, and as soon as I could breathe again, I felt two hands wrap around my throat. I just barely finished whimpering that prayer, and I kept my eyes closed. But suddenly, I felt two wet noses against my face. I opened my eyes and saw the thankfully unharmed two dogs. I awkwardly hugged them both and pet them for another ten minutes. Then I just left and stayed the night at my grandma's house. I have no idea what that thing was. A demon, perhaps. 
a demon that wanted me dead. I'm just happy those dogs were there, trying to protect me. Sadly, Odin's owner died not long after the event. They said he just stopped breathing in his sleep. I'm not sure if I can believe that, though. I ended up adopting Odin back then. There were a couple of times where Odin would stare out the patio door. Occasionally, he would sleep in front of my door, even though he always slept in bed with me. Other times, he'd curl up next to me and would be staring at the door when I went to sleep and when I woke up. Animals are sensitive to the supernatural, more than us humans are. But I was also so freaked out by that experience that now, even five years later, I still have a cross hanging above my bedroom and entryway door. Poor Odin died about a half a year ago. It seems like he was my lucky charm all this time, because nowadays I feel watched no matter where I go. When Odin was still around, we had moved to the US two years back, and I wasn't bothered by anything creepy. Now, though, I can't stop seeing things, things that seem to hide in the dark. Not Bowser from Liar Song Bird. Only one other person knows the story I'm about to share. He and I go to the same summer camp. I've been going to this summer camp since elementary school. I'm old hat with the schedule by now. Every morning begins at 7.30 with the wake-up call, and we have 45 minutes to get ready for a morning meeting on the basketball courts in front of the cafeteria. Right after that, at 8.30, it's time for breakfast, which is over at 9.30. Then we have free time till 11. Afterwards, we meet back at the courts for activity block, which changes from day to day depending on which color wristband you get at the start of camp week. At 2 is lunch, followed by a quiet activity, then lessons or crafts. In the evening, the canteen opens and we have free time until supper. And once supper is over, we have free swim in the pool until 8. When the pool closes, we get ready for the bonfire, which is over at 10.30, leaving us half an hour until curfew where we have to be back in the dorms, with lights out at midnight. Day in, day out, that schedule never changes, but it's nice knowing what to expect every day. What isn't so nice is being unable to fall asleep. It was nearly an hour past lights out and I was still wide awake that night. I thought maybe if I opened the window next to my bunk, the cool night air would help me relax. I nearly screamed, though, when I rolled over and noticed a shape at the window staring at me. I quickly sighed in relief once I recognized Bowser. Bowser was the camp director at St. Bernard. He's a lovable doof of a dog, and it seemed he had somehow gotten off his chain. When Bowser saw that I was looking at him, he started to wag his tail and whine excitedly. Shh, bow wow, I hiss. But the window was still closed, so I don't think he heard me. He did his little play bow shuffle that gave him his name. Then he whined again, louder this time. I winced and checked over my shoulder. Nobody was moving. So I cracked the bottom of the window open and pushed the pane up ever so slowly. Bowser, it's night night. Go home. I commanded, pointing him towards the big house, where Mr. Racine and his family lived. Bowser barked loudly, and I whipped around to check my bunkmates again. Miraculously, no one seemed to have heard him that time either. By the time I looked back to the window again, all I saw was Bowser's floof of a tail disappearing around the corner of the chapel hall. He was going home then. Good, I thought. Hopefully, his family wouldn't notice he'd gotten loose in the first place. I settled back into bed, putting the odd incident from my mind until morning. The next day, in fact, I'd forgotten altogether, until I saw Xander, the camp director's son, at the morning meeting the following day. I called out a good morning to him. Hey, Lyra, he greeted me. I bumped my shoulder against his and grinned. So how hard was it to catch Bows this morning? I joked. Uh, what are you talking about? 
Well, I saw Bowser outside my dorm window after lights out. He got off his chain last night, I guess. No, he didn't, Xander laughed. He stayed inside and slept in my parents' room last night. He and Sophie both did. They would not settle down after the bonfire, and Mom figured they saw a deer or something. Before I could explain, I caught sight of something over his shoulder that shook my thoughts loose. Bowser was lounging across the flat-topped roof of his doghouse, and his fur had been sheared short. But when I saw him just last night, his coat was full and fluffy. I know how long it takes to shave his fur down. Xander complains about it every year. There's no way Bowser's fur was shaved down since last night. Xander, how long has Bowser had his summer lion cut? I asked, hollowly, staring at the dog sunbathing on his doghouse roof. Since Monday. Why? I can feel the blood draining from my face even as I answered. Because the St. Bernard I saw last night was full-coated. Uh, maybe one of the neighbors got a new dog. There's no way. This one performed Bowser's little play shuffle too. That's why I thought it was him. Now Xander looked as nervous as I felt. Well, if it wasn't Bowser, then what did I see last night? Another thought occurred to me, and I blurted it out. Oh crap, the girls' room doors don't lock. We still have those swinging saloon doors on the front. So what if something wants to get inside? What are you getting at, Lai? Well, whatever I saw that looked like Bowser was smart enough to also imitate his behavior. It was trying to get me outside. I don't want to think about what it's capable of. I breathed deeply. We need to tell your dad. Yeah, like heck he would believe your ghost Bowser story, Xander scoffed. Not that part, obviously. I rolled my eyes. We'll say I just saw a rabid coyote outside my window last night when I got up to use the restroom. Then we'll point out that the girl's dorm isn't safe until the saloon doors get replaced with regular locking doors. That may not be until the end of the week, though. Where will the girls sleep until then? Xander asked. The chapel hall? Yeah, the chapel hall. That has locking doors, and it's right next door. It'll be easier to move everyone's stuff over. Okay, Xander nodded. I'll tell him the idea after lunch. He has free time then. Okay, I sighed, feeling a bit better, now that we had a plan. You do believe me, right? I asked him. He smiled and nodded. Yeah, I don't think you panic easily. No way you'd be faking that. Good. Meet me here after lunch, okay? I requested. Xander agreed. Then we both followed our fellow campers into the cafeteria hall. I tried to take my mind off of things, knowing that an adult can handle the situation once we tell them about the rabid coyote. And for the most part, it worked. After breakfast with my camp friends, I felt a lot calmer. Back outside on the basketball courts, the campers dispersed for free time. I could hear Xander and his friends whooping as they headed over to the sports shed to grab some game equipment. I myself headed back to the girls' room to take the shower I skipped that morning. Before I get more than three steps away, I felt a hand wrap around my wrist. I turned back to see Xander staring over my shoulder, his face ashen, eyes glossy. Lyra, look, he hissed, pointing. I followed his gaze, my blood freezing. On the northwest end of the camp, sitting in the shade under the rock wall, was a fluffy-coated St. Bernard. It was staring right at me. I could feel it. Xander and I continued to stare at it, and he squeezed my wrist tighter. His fingers felt like ice, and when I gripped his wrist in return, I'm sure mine were icy too. As not Bowser stood slowly, its eyes caught the light of a sunbeam, making them glow briefly a sickeningly green-gold color. This sent chills racing down my spine, but I still couldn't move a muscle. Xander and I broke out of our fear trance. The real one at his doghouse behind the big house lunged to the end of his chain, barking like crazy. I flinched, 
and Xander made a sound similar to a choked back sob. Not Bowser never took his eyes off us as it slowly backed away into the soy fields that bordered the west side of the camp. It crouched low to the ground and vanished. My, I've never seen a dog walk backwards like that before, Xander said thickly around a gulp. That's no dog. We have to tell your dad, now. We made a run for the big house, clinging desperately to each other's hands. I could feel not Bowser's stare digging into the back of my head. I didn't look back, and I hoped that was the last we would see of the not Bowser thing. The Dead Zone of Florida From Silver Bullet 54 Interstate 4 in Florida is a nice road most of the time, though at the same time something about it seems strange. People have trouble finding cell phone signal there. Things sometimes appear and disappear. Drivers suddenly meet someone they don't know who may offer them assistance. The following experience is from my best friend Grant. This happened one day in 2009. Since he had just gotten his license, he took a trip down to the south. As he was driving through Florida, several motorists warned him about the dead zone. That spot of I-4 is apparently host to a whole mess of issues that no one can explain. To him, it was nothing but fairy tales, overactive imaginations, and superstition. He'd heard about Gravity Hills, which he believed to be just optical illusions, and figured he was just being told these stories so they could scare a non-resident. For Grant, he had to experience it to believe it, and soon enough, he believed in the dead zone. As he traveled through this dead zone, his engine light kept flashing on and off, even though his car was in great shape. He also kept getting static on the radio, even though there should have been no interference at all. Eventually, he stopped to see if something was wrong. As he looked under the hood, a car stopped by, and a young woman who said her surname was Sana offered to help. He politely declined the offer, but she clearly wasn't happy about that. She began to glare at him before then speeding away. Before long, he saw another motorist who stopped to see if he needed help. When the man stopped, Grant asked him, By the way, did you see that woman driving the Camry? The man looked back at him like he was crazy and said, What are you talking about? I was just behind you. No one was ahead of us. As soon as Grant got back to his car, a big rig driver stopped and called out, Need a lift, Grant? His mind was so boggled at the moment that after accepting the ride and halfway through the trip, only then did he realize the trucker should not have known his name. This was the first time he'd been to Florida. He shook it off and just waited until they reached a service station. The trucker told Grant he could call a tow truck from there. Grant thanked him and asked if he needed anything. The trucker declined and politely waved before departing. Grant then asked a young man at the station about the trucker. The station worker said, Guess you met Billy. He was such a nice guy. Just a shame he died 11 years back in an accident. In fact, it happened on I-4, at a place they call the Dead Zone. Have you heard of it? Apparently, he's been haunting the place ever since, offering folks help like he did in life. Grant replied that he never heard of it, even though he had. In the end, maybe all of this stuff was easily explained or a bunch of coincidences. Or maybe, just maybe, the spirits of I-4 are more alive than your usual ghosts. Either way, if you ever travel through Florida, avoid the dead zone if you can. A nice drive is better than a haunting encounter at any rate. Possible Hellhound Encounter From X Blood This happened when I was around 13 or 14, living with my now divorced parents. This took place in Missouri. My family resided on a decent property. 
I don't recall the exact month, but it was probably somewhere between October and early December. My bedroom was in the basement, along with my two sisters whom I'll refer to by their online names, Hunter and Fall. I often spent time in Hunter's room, and we would stay up very late. Her room was closest to the upstairs door. I can't remember what triggered it, but Hunter started to become paranoid, which caused me to look at the door to the upstairs. I had a clear view of it from where I was seated, and it had a glass panel. I'm quite certain that I also became paranoid then too, and together we went to the living room. Hunter and I decided to sleep upstairs and planned to inform Fall about this. However, as I walked away, I glanced at the door and noticed a shape forming through the glass. I swear I could see two red eyes. I looked at them, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me. There were black trash bags behind the door, but I realized it was different. When I realized, the shape I was seeing appeared to be that of a wolf. A black wolf. Since I didn't want to go near it, Hunter and I clung to the wall and crawled over to Fall's room. We woke her up and informed her about what we saw, and the three of us went upstairs together to sleep in the living room. I stayed awake all night, unable to escape this feeling of overwhelming fear. It was as if something was warning me not to sleep. The feeling lingered for a while before dissipating, and I felt safe enough to finally rest. The next morning, I went downstairs. I always kept a bottle of water in the fridge down there. When I went to get that water, I noticed it was partially frozen. This struck me as odd, because the water never froze like that unless it was in the middle of winter. Missouri is generally a very warm state. Now at 16 years old, I live with my grandparents. Last November, my grandparents' dog passed away. On the following night, I experienced the all-too-familiar feeling, the same sensation I had back then when I encountered what I believed to be a hellhound. I didn't see it this time, but I knew it was there. I had a strong feeling that day would not be the last time I saw or felt something related to that hellhound. Extraterrestrial Encounters from B Man 419. This happened in mid June of 2020 in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. I'd been living here for almost six years at the time, and there had never been any strange occurrences. I fell asleep one night next to my fiance, and a couple of hours after falling asleep, I woke up. I went to the kitchen for a drink of water. From the kitchen window overlooking the backyard, I noticed a light blue hue illuminating the yard. Curious, I walked out onto the back deck through the patio door to see where this light was coming from. As I opened the door, I saw a creature crouch down in the far corner. This creature was blue with an unusual texture. Intrigued, I walked across the deck to get a better look, and as I did, the creature stood up reaching a height of six to seven feet. I was startled. I also noticed a second creature, approximately four to five feet tall, which I hadn't seen until then. I greeted them, saying hello nervously. Both creatures turned towards me, revealing small beak-like features on their faces. I heard them reply to me, but not physically. Their response came in my mind. Do not worry. We are peaceful. I asked where they came from. The smaller one pointed towards the sky. Looking up, I saw a blue orb of light. When I glanced farther away, I noticed multiple orbs of different colors in the sky extending beyond neighboring houses. I was astonished by what I witnessed. As the being stood motionless, observing me, I invited them to come into the house and talk. The taller being began to walk slowly towards the deck stairs. As I crossed the deck to open the patio door, the taller being placed its hand-like appendage on my shoulder, 
and the next thing I knew, I awoke in my bed at 7 a.m. Oddly enough, I felt relieved, well-rested, and free of anxiety. It was my first encounter with an extraterrestrial being, and I was so excited that I shared the experience with many people. Only a few believed me. A couple of months later, I was sitting on the front step smoking a cigarette when I heard a deep, quiet hum coming from the west toward the river that divides the west side of the city from the south and north sides. I stared into the sky for a while. I soon noticed seven dim lights forming a triangular shape. Unfortunately, I didn't have my phone or a camera with me at the time. I watched as the craft moved slowly across the night sky at a relatively low altitude. I should mention here I grew up in a large Air Force training base in northern Alberta, so I was familiar with various military aircraft due to my childhood experiences and my family's interest in air travel. As I observed the craft, it reached the northernmost point where I would have lost sight of it. But instead, it turned its tip towards the sky and accelerated at speeds I had never witnessed before. There was no sonic boom, no loud engines like those typically associated with conventional aircraft. Once again, I went around telling all my friends about it, but few believed me. Within the same month, my father came to visit. I shared with him my encounters and recent sightings. He seemed skeptical at first, but acknowledged that there was a chance that what I saw was real. We spent a long time sitting in the backyard, lying in the grass, enjoying the peacefulness without the need to impress anyone. As we gazed up at the sky, we pointed out constellations and watched a few passenger jets fly overhead, wishing we could afford to travel wherever they were going. Suddenly, we spotted a craft with seven lights moving slowly overhead. He told me, Ah, that's just a military jet. I disagreed, but we kept staring at the sky as the craft came back overhead again, moving slowly through the sky and accelerating to a speed we could not comprehend. A small streak of light was left where the craft had been for a brief moment. I kid you not, my father looked right at me and immediately said, All right, son, I believe you. That's no aircraft I have ever seen before and I've never seen a craft accelerate without making a sound, no matter how far below we are. So I retold him my stories, and he was blown away, realizing it wasn't just my imagination. We both felt blessed to have witnessed it. We spent another couple of hours looking at the sky, hoping it would come back, but unfortunately, we had no luck. I started to research meditation, spirituality, telepathy, and of course, theories about aliens. Two years later, I moved to a different part of the same city, about four kilometers or approximately 2.5 miles north of my old residence. One night while lying in bed, I felt a presence I could not see. I decided to try what I'd been researching and communicate through my mind with the presence. I questioned it via thought. Would you be able to show me something I've never seen before? I wasn't honestly expecting a response, but I suddenly heard a voice that sounded nothing like my own reply, yes. The next thing I knew, I was looking out of a large window, staring at a big circle of blue, white, gold, and green. I soon realized I was looking at the earth from above. The earth slowly disappeared in the distance, and as I looked around the craft, I noticed two lights moving around as if floating. I asked if they were what I had asked for, and they said yes. I continued to ask questions about our civilization and why we're unable to achieve peace. I asked if peace was even achievable on Earth. Solemnly, they said no. We discussed ways Earth could achieve peace and what its future might look like. Eventually, I asked if they could return me five hours after they'd picked me up, and they agreed. I awoke in my bed to the sound of my wife's alarm at 5.30 a.m., feeling as if I'd been awake all night long. But still, I felt rejuvenated and free from the clutches of hate, at least for the time being.
Possessed by the Pig Man From Elementus This story comes from a long line of interactions and frights throughout the decades, based around the legend of the Pig Man, or, to the locals, Pig Man Road, a stretch of haunted road between two railroad bridges that cross over Holland Road. This legend is very real. Just googling Pigman of Ingela or Pigman Road pulls up loads of information. Plus, it was featured on a travel channel show called Hometown Horrors. Various incidents have happened, but my group and I seem to have gotten the worst one. A case of possession. This happened back in 2006, if I recall correctly. The first time I went to Pigman Road, I went with my best friend and a bunch of guy friends with the intention of ghost hunting, simply to see if we could catch anything on film. We chose our spot just after passing under the arched railroad bridge and started to take pictures with my digital camera. I even climbed up onto the embankment to wander a little up and down the railroad tracks as well. After climbing back down when the tracks proved to be quiet, I kept taking pictures of the bridge and road. The mood that night was lighthearted, yet a bit subdued, as if the air was thick and heavy and quiet of all ambient sounds, which none of us seemed to notice. After almost an hour, we piled back into my best friend's car and headed back towards our homes, planning to head to Denny's to go over the pictures I took. As we passed back under the bridge, I'm not sure what prompted it since I was in the front passenger seat, but the boys in the back seat turned to look out the rear window as we cleared the tunnel. Suddenly, they started to exclaim and freak out. Apparently, when they looked back, they spotted a tall and imposing shadow man standing dead center on the bridge near the tracks, watching us leave. Once that particular excitement passed, we continued on with our plans, discussing the shadow man, deciding that it couldn't have possibly been a real human because we would have seen them on the tracks coming our way, or we would have heard them on the gravel of the tracks, or even in the woods flanking us. Once we got back to town and settled at Denny's, we turned our attention to my pictures. There wasn't too much of interest besides orbs in the pictures, solid orbs that were caught mid-motion with their own comet tails and heading in all directions. One picture, however, stood out from the rest, I had taken a picture facing back towards my bestie's car, and in the beam of the running lights that we left on, partly to give us some light on the otherwise pitch black road, and partly to alert other cars that may be coming down the road that we were there, were two shadows that didn't look like much until we realized that they were spaced a normal width apart as if someone was standing in front of the car. But the whole of the body was not visible, only the feet. It wasn't too long before we went back to do more hunting, maybe the next weekend or so. Once again, we parked near the arch bridge. We were going to change it up a bit and go to the other bridge, but when we got to the area, we could hear sounds of a large party at the other bridge. That should have been our cue to go, right then and right there, that any party would agitate the pig man. But we simply decided to go to the arch bridge, and investigate there again, where it was quiet. This time I got more pictures of orbs, including a mysterious flash of light when taking a picture on burst mode. In one picture, it wasn't there, and in the next shot, this weird light flashed on the top of the picture. The air was charged and heavy again, but we didn't really notice. If I had the intuitive training I have now, I would have noticed but hindsight is twenty twenty. We started walking into the tunnel. A few feet in, my best friend just suddenly stopped dead in her tracks, and her face went slack. We asked what was wrong, but there was no reply. Her pupils were dilated, almost swallowing up the green of her iris. Finally, she spoke, and it was not her voice, and I don't recall the exact wording, but basically... She said that she was his now, as a prize for us disturbing him. I am pagan comedic, 
which is the belief in the ancient Egyptian gods. I know this all may sound bizarre, but in that moment, I heard a voice in my head, something telling me that I had the strength to handle this, and that whoever the voice belonged to would lend me aid. I knew then what I had to do. I faced my best friend, and in a loud voice asserted that I would use this aid to cast the pig man out of my friend and send him back to the darkness. I wrapped my arms around her from behind, and I began to pull her and walk with her back to the car. She resisted every step of the way, but I've always been short, stocky, and strong, and managed to overpower her. It wasn't until we got back to the car that my best friend suddenly gasped for air and came back to her normal self. I'd won, and she didn't even know what had happened. We filled her in and promptly got the heck out of Dodge. We never went back, but I think one day I'd like to return, now that I have more skills in my mental abilities and intuition. I'd like to see the old pig man try this again with me around. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.